Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. We're delighted today, and truly it's, it's an honor uh, to uh, be hosting um, uh, Rabbi Alyssa Wise, a Deputy Director of Jewish Voice for Peace and JVP Action. You've read her views in, on anti-Semitism, solidarity in the struggle for justice, and reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, as well as in the opinion pages at Newsweek, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Forward, Huffington Post, and Religious News Services, and have heard her on NPR, Democracy Now!, and others. Alyssa, welcome. Thank you. It's so fun to be here. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I have a, um, a strong connection to Indiana. I, my mom is from Gary, um, Indiana, and my, a bunch of my family's in Indianapolis. And I went to Indiana University and actually everybody in my family who's ever gone to college went to Indiana University. So I'm like a Hoosier through and through. My parents met there. So like, I've got an emotional connection to you all in Indiana, an ancestral connection. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, good. Um, I wanna just get right into it in July, this past July at a uh, United Against Racism rally. You opened with these words. The Trump presidency has irrevocably changed my understanding of Jews in America. From the moment mm -hmm. I heard the chance of Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville. And Trump defended them as, quote, very fine people. It all turned upside down for me. I mm -hmm. want you to tell us more about this turning upside down what that meant for you as a, as a Jew, as a mm. rabbi, and as a Palestinian activist, as a woman, you know? Yeah, thank Talk you. about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I grew up um, in Ohio, actually. I'm from Cincinnati. Um, and in a kind of fairly traditional insular Jewish community, um, that was actually very Zionist. Um, part of my history is that I, as a young person, was a pro-Zionist activist. Um, and it was actually only in college. Um, I spent my junior year abroad at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, where I had a change of heart. Um, um, it was a year break from Indiana University. Um, and it's interesting because there was some ways that I broke right, had a breaking from my family of origin. And there were some things that lasted and stuck with me, obviously, right? So I, um, I recently actually got, uh, my dad was moving and he found this folder of mine from that year, including my application essay to go study in Jerusalem that year. And at that point, I still believed in this idea that Israel was um, a social justice project, right? And was about um, safety for Jews, right? That was still my idea at that point. Um, and as I read this essay that I wrote over 20 years ago, right? So I went in 1999, um, my junior year abroad. Um, and it was interesting to read it because I heard in my voice, my college um, voice, <laughs> Um, kind of real threads of what I still believe today as far as what inspired me to be a rabbi, what inspired me um, to dedicate my life to ensuring that Judaism continues as a force for good in the world and as a framework for ethical living and as a framework for meaning making um, and to live on um, what my ancestors and my forebearers fought for as far as living Jewish lives. Um, and the thing and how this connects to your question and what that means for me of that turning upside down, right? Because when I heard you say that back to me just now, I kind of was like, well, was it really a turning upside down? But I think it really was. Cause I think a core piece of kind of what has stuck 
with me all these years was that, um, that I think has really been shaken to its core was, um, you know, my education growing up in the Jewish day school I went to in Cincinnati and from the Jewish summer camps I went to and from the Jewish family I was a part of was kind of a two-part idea. The first is that um, Jews are alone in the world and throughout history when Jews have been vulnerable um, to the countries that they live under, like nobody's come to save them, right? And the Nazi Holocaust is the perfect, like most dramatic illustration of that. And that's why Israel is needed, right? As a safe haven. And the other idea is that we at this point in history have learned the lessons of the Nazi Holocaust and it's never gonna happen again, right? Like there is this sense, this like idea of never again, right? Was something that was um, really ingrained in me and a sense of safety came from that. And um, while I still understood that there were moments of like interpersonal anti-Semitism that I would experience. So for example, actually one of the early, one of my first years at college, it must've been 1997 or 1998 on Holocaust Memorial Day, um, somebody put a bust of Hitler's head on the steps of the Jewish community center on, on IU's campus with a sign that said, happy Holocaust Remembrance Day from the man who made it happen, right? So I understood that there wasn't, anti-Semitism wasn't, um, didn't disappear, but there was this larger sense that like, there had been a, a kind of a global agreement that um, we would never let anything like that happen again, or that the ideas that undergird Nazism, right, are like not a part of our civil society anymore. And so when Trump kind of in the high, like even as, terrified I was of what his presidency would mean. And if I understood how dreadful his policies would be, um, I think I had been lulled into a certain sense of that that was going to be beyond the pale, right? That his embrace of kind of like classical anti-Semitism and his um, refusal to distance himself from it, as he's still doing, right? Like last week at the debate, right? When he was his statement about the Proud Boys. Um, and so I think it kind of like shook me awake in a new way of like, oh, like it's not as I had thought it was that there was a certain um, progress, I guess, about ideas about anti-Semitism and Jews, right? Um, those ideas that we thought kind of were in the ash bins of history after the, the horrors of the Nazi Holocaust are now being embraced by the president of the United States. I think that was um, truly shocking for me to really understand the data. Um, Cause I hadn't, again, like even at the interpersonal level I might've experienced it, but at the level of structural embrace of those anti-Semitic ideas, um, my, my thought was that that was not something that was gonna be part of our present day anymore. Let me let me pursue that just a little bit. Um, those of us on the screen here who are Palestinian activists, we get it. You know that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, but I also think it's fair to say that over the years, uh, Jewish anti-Zionists uh, uh, have emboldened those of us who are non-Jews in the public square to say mm. that very thing, uh, and I guess. You know, we here in Indiana, we've we've had we've had we've had partnerships with JVB Detroit with Barbara Harvey, who's on this call, by the way, and Mark <laughs> Snyderman, Mark Snyderman in Indianapolis, JVP Indianapolis. They've they provided, for lack of a better term, cover for the kinds of programs mm -hmm. that we've offered. Has, has JVP uh, uh, been intentional about that uh, from its start. Talk to us a little bit about the the, the JVP's influence on non-Jewish organizations as well, and its impact it's had on folks like ourselves to be more emboldened in speaking about yeah. anti-Zionism. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. It's actually interesting to reflect on and think about because, you know, like it makes me think of um, a lot of, some of you on the call might have, are likely been part of these efforts within your churches to um, divest from the Israeli occupation, right? And JVP partnered with the Presbyterians and with the Methodists and the Episcopalian, right? UCC, like a bunch of different movements. Um, and during that time of like the heyday, particularly with Presbyterian divestment, I did spend a lot of time going around to churches and, in, and kind of emboldening churches, right? And churchgoers um, and Presbyterians who were at the general assemblies where they were voting on, on divestment um, to stay in touch with their own conscience and their own political commitments, right? And, and you know, be brave enough to fight for what they really believe. And a lot of that was based on the fact that um, my, some of my fellow Jews in their community were threatening their interfaith relationships, um, saying, if you voted for divestment, we are no longer friends. We are no longer interfaith partners, right? Um, and that, and so I think it's not just a perception that you will be called anti-Semitic, it's, it's gonna be met with action, right? That people are gonna take away their friendship, their partnership, right? Um, but at the same time, when I would go to these churches, um, I would, people would say, well, what do I say if somebody says I'm being anti-Semitic? And the thing that I would often say is like, well, are you, right? And so <laughs> there's nothing anti-Semitic in critiquing Israel. There's nothing anti-Semitic in drawing attention to um, decades of Palestinian dispossession. There's nothing anti-Semitic about wanting to align your church's investments with their values. That doesn't mean that you don't hold actual anti-Semitic ideas in your own heart, right? Um, and that could be actually separate from what are political convictions of yours. And I think that's actually really important. Um, and I think it's something that has concerned me as far as like, you know, the language of, that you're using of like, cover like providing cover like I feel like I do it just want to say that I have a moment pause with that because I think the last thing that I want to do and I think the Trump years have really brought this into focus is the last thing I want to do is say like is for people to feel like they're off the hook from interrogating anti-semitic ideas that they may have kind of ingested or incorporated into their way of seeing the world as young people, like early in their lives in church, like the Christian doctrine has a lot of anti-Semitism yeah, baked into it, right? And you have to deliberately investigate that. Just as as a white person, I have to do the same around my own anti-Black racism or anti-Arab racism, right? Like I can't act like cavalier enough that that isn't part of me, right? So I think I wanna be careful in saying that on the one side, yes, absolutely. We wanna embolden everybody. We wanna like challenge the threatening nature of the way that some in the Jewish community hold support for Israel over people's heads and say, if you want our friendship, if you want our support, if you want, um, like you have to follow this political line, that's extremely dangerous. We wanna interrupt this idea that criticizing Israel is somehow anti-Semitic. And of course it's not because Israel is not synonymous with Judaism and with Jewishness. But at the same time, we can't allow it to be that actual anti-Semit, that it then becomes a boy who cried wolf phenomenon, right? Where the false charges of anti-Semitism create a situation where actual anti-Semitism, right? Um, you know, is swept under the rug, you know? And I think like, one of the things that I've been thinking about, like looking at Trump, right? And his kind of, his approach, right? He does what's like a classic bait and switch, right? He first says, engages in classic anti-Semitism by, for example, claiming Jewish people are masterminds of the political positions that he and his base disagree with, which is exactly what led to the murder of 11 worshipers in Pittsburgh, Jewish worshipers in synagogue in Pittsburgh. And at the same time, he touts for his, his support for Israel as proof that he's not anti-Semitic. Right. So he stokes his base to fear and mistrust Jews um, and claims that 
he's the best friend to Jews, right? Um, because he supports Israel. So in insisting that like the only real manifestation of anti-Semitism is critique of Israel, it's, you know, actually incredibly threatening for me as a Jew. Like I feel very unsafe when he does that. Um, and of course there's also um, a broader concern of the stifling of free speech in support of Palestinian rights and the ability for Palestinians in the United States to, you know, college students on campuses, being able just to tell the stories of their own family's histories is then labeled as an anti-Semitic hate crime, which is just completely unacceptable, right? And so I think it's like really incumbent upon us to really understand how the right and Trump are using this. And the truth is, it's not just the right, like Trump is very extreme, but you know, a groups like the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, who is supposed to be that like watchdog around anti-Semitism in the Jewish community has really just become um, a defender of Israel and, and perpetuates this idea that the only, that criticism of Israel is the most potent anti-Semitic threat in the United States, which is just not the case. You know, uh, when I used to, uh, when, when I used to teach in university, uh, it really was a, it was really a, a time for me. I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. And so I really had to check, you know, and I taught religious studies and women in religion and world religions. And, you know, I had to check my uh, sexist uh, views, you know, I mean, uh, unconscious sexist views. Right, of course. Un yeah. Unconscious racist views, unconscious anti-Semitic views, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I check all the boxes, right? I mean, I, I really had to kind of uh, uh, do a self-critique every time I opened my mouth. And my students were my teachers, really, you know, uh, and, and my kids, too. Yeah. And so I resonate. I resonate with what you were saying. And I want to pursue I want to pursue one of the lines of of your your uh, answer. Uh, already in 2016, JVP endorsed the movement for black lives, uh, the platform, their platform in its entirety without reservation. And I could go down the list of names, you know, Ahmad Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, et cetera, and too many more now, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, this is gonna be a multi-part question, but, but, but this raises all kinds of issues for our society not only the, the racism that's been endemic in our society, but also the police state, mm. the surveillance state and the, the militarization of American police and the Israelification of the militarization of American police. So could you help us untangle or connect all those? But they all seem connected to me, don't, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, say a word. You know, I feel like these systems of repression, right, are deeply connected. And it's not just Israel and the United States, right? Like these webs of surveillance, policing, militarized policing, um, these worst practices are being traded amongst a lot of these, these nations that are being led by right wing, you know, ideologues. <laughs> um, and so... You know, one of the things that um, that we notice is that it's really an exchange. It, it's really a truly an exchange, right? Like, it, the U.S. was had a racist policing system from its origins, right? The origins of the U.S. police is, are um, is is from the days of when slavery was still legal, and police started as a force to catch runaway slaves. Absolutely. Um, and that's actually a really important thing for us to grapple with, right? And when you think about the way that Black people are disproportionately um, murdered by the police, you have to understand where that history comes from, right? So it's not that they needed, that there was some, that the U.S. police were perfect. And then all of a sudden Israel came into the picture and now they have these really dangerous practices. No, that's not what it is. Um, what we're seeing though, is that when, you know, you, the U S and Israel have shared values and those values are of control, violence, um, dispossession, 
um, kind of of racism, right? And it's based on those short those shared values that they have that they come together and do these police training programs, right? And so the police trainings that the U.S. engages in with the Israeli Defense Forces, um, who specialize in military tactics, do you know do not make our communities any safer, right? That's our basic belief, right? And that we need to invest in our communities for greater safety, and that's actually. And I think this, the uprisings of the summer kind of really brought that home in these calls to defund the police and like really looking at what that means. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important is that there are practices that are that the US police are learning from Israel and, but it's actually, it keeps going back and forth, right? So years ago, uh, some of us on this call, it sounds like we're part of a campaign um, called the We Divest campaign where we were targeting the um, retirement fund giant TIA CREF to divest um, from companies that profit from the occupation um, in their in their programs. Um, we did have a victory there. They did they did remove some of the companies that we highlighted um, from their socially responsible investment um, profiles. But one of the things that we really learned throughout that campaign and kind of doing a deep dive into the various corporations that were um, including even in their socially responsible investment portfolios, is that these were companies that were um, benefiting from having a relationship with Israel where they had a population of control where they could test. Basically, it was just like road testing. Um, sometimes it was weapons, but in the more socially responsible ones, it was kind of like surveillance technologies or in the case of Caterpillar, right? Like militarized bulldozers. Um, and that they were, Israel was becoming a giant in these military tactics by because of the occupation of Palestine and because of their control of Palestinians. Um, and so I, and those relationships are bolstered by the military aid that the US Israel, right? So it's really, it just is like these exchanges of values of these, like wrong-headed values, I would say of military aid. Um, and I think over, you know, we started our campaign called, that we called the Deadly Exchange Campaign to kind of raise attention about um, these, this, these deadly exchanges, right? Between the US and the IDF. And one of the reasons that um, we kind of invested in this campaign is because we learned that, as I mentioned before, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which began really as the name suggests, right, um, against the defamation of the Jewish people, um, and is a self-proclaimed civil rights group, is actually one of the organizers um, in these exchange programs. The ADL itself runs exchange programs between the U.S. Um, and you know, what happens there is um, in those exchanges, um, militarized policing is being encouraged, right? And I think like, for example, like in the Ferg uprising, when Michael Brown was murdered, um, we started to see some of the same tactics as of us who have spent time in Palestine, in Berlin or in other protests saw from the Israeli military, right? So we do know that these exchanges are real, right? It's not just ideas. These are practices that we're then seeing on the streets, right? And here in Philadelphia, during the uprisings this summer, right? Like my neighborhood did turn into, like I really felt like I was back in Palestine from the days that I spent there um, during the second Intifada and um, being with Palestinian communities there, it felt very reminiscent. Um, and so I think our, our belief is that these exchange programs are wrong. And especially in the face of this awakening that we're in the middle of, um, of this um, movement for black lives, a lot of us are rising. Um, and so many people I've seen like in my own community and my own family kind of become awake um, to what's going on. You know, the reality that our police and these worst practices where Palestinians under occupation are guinea for Israeli weapons and tactics, and then we're seeing them come here, it just needs to stop. And the fact that a, civil, a self civil rights group is the one organizing such 
exchanges is unconscionable, right? It's that I think that the issue for us then is um, how do we create communities outside of policing, right? So for one thing, like, especially in the wake of the murders in synagogues that we've seen over the past number of years, um, we've worked with a network of synagogues who are committing to not participating in policing or, or, or having any kinds of um, kind of armed uh, security, um, which is <coughs> what the strategy of the mainstream Jewish community has been. They reached synagogues and said like, we are be having more relationships with the FBI, more relationships with our local law enforcement. And in Jewish communities, you know, the Jewish communities are often seen as monolithically white, but they're not, right? Um, Jews are, they're Jews of every race. Um, and so we also have to think about how does it, how would it feel if you're a black Jew coming in to your synagogue and you're stopped by police at the door or the kinds of ways that it creates an environment where people will feel unsafe, like coming to houses of worship, right? Um, and needing to ensure that whatever solutions that we design outside of the police, like genuinely do keep people safe. And so we are taking that up seriously, um, are engaged in real ways in creating those alternatives. Tonight, uh, thank you. Tonight uh, is a vice presidential debate. <clears throat> um, we'll, get to, we'll get to talking about the Democrat candidate and uh, his uh, choice for vice president, but I wanna to talk to you about Christian Zionism. Uh, I love talking about Christian Zionism. <laughs> I, 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 I figured I'd give you an opening here. This question comes from our, our friend Don Wagner uh, from Chicago. Uh, he wants to know what JVP's take is on Christian Zionism. Here's the key to his question, particularly the political form of Christian Zionism, namely Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, and the rest of the political actors, you know? And he wants to know, are there any red lines we need to heed politically and theologically as we declare it a heresy? I'm there, I don't, like, red lines, I need a well, little- Well, yes, it embraces, embraces anti-Semitism, racism, ethnic cleansing. I mean, uh, uh, talk to us about the political arm of Christian Zionism yeah. and how it really is embedded in, in this administration. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I actually have been thinking about a lot recently is the fact that Balfour was also a Christian Zionist, right? So like, yeah, exactly. we can look far back, right? When we talk about Christian Zionism, we don't like, it actually has been a part of the story of the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel um, from the beginning, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that's something really important to remember because I think like the reasons I said like with enthusiasm I love to talk about Christian Zionism is like the one of the reasons that I feel <laughs> that way about it is because I think that there is a problem and if I'm going to be completely frank I think there is an anti semitism problem about the ways in which the the lobby that exists to enable Israel um is as often depicted as a lobby of Jewish interests. And it's not, right? It just isn't. And there is, is a way in which um, I feel like for a long time, and you know, tr the Trump administration has actually given us a huge opportunity to kind of shine on the way that Christian Zionists have, have a huge influence in setting US foreign policy. Um, and that's, it just hasn't, it's, always been true it's not just true Trump, right there's always right. been a huge element of the pro-israel lobby that is um fundamentally christian zionist and i think the thing that's really important about understanding the problem of that of course is that um christian zionism in many ways is deeply anti-semitic itself right so you know john hagee for example who the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, yesterday wished well and claimed was one of, or not one of, but the best friend, the best friend to Israel, Israel. right? Yeah. Um, 
you know, he lauded Hitler. He believes that one day Jews will either have to convert to Christianity or burn, right? There's not, there's actually not a more anti-Semitic idea than that, right? And so um, you have this, it's kind of goes beyond strange bedfellows, right? When it comes to Christian Zionism, right? And you have these interests um, of Christian Zionists that kind of dangerously mi mix um, church and state, basically. <laughs> um, and you have people who are now, we're now at a point where Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, as you mentioned, themselves Christian Zionists are um, setting US foreign policy motivated by this idea of what Jewish settlement in, in historic Palestine means for the second coming, right? And so, um, but, I, you know, and I think on the side of like the Israeli government, they see it as a convenient alliance to move forward their goals and probably to themselves just say like, oh, but they're wrong about that. Like that Christian thing, like, never mind that, that that's just what they believe, but it's not true. And fundamentally never kind of deal with what the real setup is, what the, how they're setting up Jews, right? In this relationship with Christian Zionism. And so I actually think it's actually, you know, for those of you that are Christian on this call or listening to this, like, I feel like, I want to challenge you to take that on. And I know so many of you have. Don Wagner, um, our friends at FOSNA, Friends of Seville North America, are taking on KUFI, Christians United for Israel, um, two years in a row, been at their conferences. And I think that's like a really welcome development because I think for far too long, um, it has been that the focus of um, the U.S.'s disastrous foreign policy as it relates to Israel and Palestine has been laid at the feet of the Jewish community in a way that is inaccurate at best and like perpetuates um, anti-Semitism at worst and is obviously um, horrible um, and murderous for Palestinians. Um, and so I think like it's incumbent upon the Christians amongst us to go inside your own communities and interrogate that, right? And, um, you know, look at the doctrines within Christianity that kind of um, encourage this line of thinking, right? And I think, you know, just as in the Jewish community, you know, it's our, you know, we challenge the ways in which people read the Torah or the Bible as, a real estate contract between God and the Jewish people, which is not what it is, right? And it's like incumbent upon us to challenge that like theological idea, right? So I guess I just want to challenge those listening to do the same within your communities. Cause I think um, to the extent that that isn't brought to light, right? And, you know, Trump himself betrays this whole myth because he has been recorded repeatedly again, just a few weeks ago saying like, you know, the Christian Zionist lobby was really behind the U.S. embassy moved to Jerusalem, for example. And he said, he said, like, flippantly, like, the Jews weren't even happy with me about that. Right. So, you know, when we look at, like, who's really behind these disastrous policies and how it's maybe more simple or more compelling to lay it at the feet of Jews and it's more complicated and more challenging to have um, a more real conversation about the way that um, Christian Zionism um, has a lot of responsibility. I want you to uh, um, say say a word about um, about BDS. Hmm. Uh, you uh, you have personal experience with uh, uh, not being allowed to travel to. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, with an with a group of uh, activists because of your support, BDS, uh, and there's a question uh, from Suzanne Weiss here about BDS too. Uh, talk to us about uh, about uh, JVP's uh, support for BDS or or in your own. Talk to us about um, uh, whether or not, and this is Suzanne, question, is JVP involved in countering the efforts to make international Holocaust remembrance alliance? law in other words bds free speech you know, yeah. uh, uh that kind of thing yeah um yeah bds has 
quite a buzzword, <laughs> you know, um, you know, in one way, you know, we, I, it's a set of tactics, right? It's a set of tactics that um, social justice movement have used for decades, right? I'm sure a lot of us on this call, some of you who uh, have been around longer than I have, all right, can count the different boycott and divestment campaigns that you had been a part of for any number of issues, whether it be economic justice, civil rights, um, food justice, right? Like an, any number of issues. Um, and, you know, I think JVP took a while actually to endorse the full call for BDS. Um, we had all along, you know, actually even before the official BDS call came out, we were engaging in some of those tactics, right? Cause they really are just the tactics. And then when Palestinian civil society organized itself and made a, like a more formal for BDS it actually took us a while. Um, to endorse it. It wasn't actually till 2015 that JVP joined um, the BDS movement in a more formal way. Um, and that, pro you know, the process that we engaged in internal to JVP to decide about that was very intentional, even as we were engaging in divestment campaigns, right? It wasn't, we didn't agree with the tactics. It just what like became a broader set of politics. And I think a lot of different factors that um, led us to finally endorse the call. Um, a prime one was um, the assaults on Gaza in 2015. Um, and not just though, of course, how devastating that was um, for Palestine and for Gaza and for the thousands of lives lost and thousands of bodies harmed and families disrupted. Um, but it also was a moment of learning for us about, you know, there's a limit to how much, like our stance had been up to that, that we engage in certain kind of boycott and divestment campaigns and we support his right to engage in BDS full stop, right? And that was something we were in deep conversation with, with the Boycott National Committee. And we engaged for years actually with our base about should we endorse the BDS call? Shouldn't we? What would it mean for like, what, what our roles were as an organization? Like, would we sacrifice some of our influence or some of the power that we were trying to build to change US foreign policy, which has always been the centerpiece of our mission. And, you know, finally it got to a point where we just couldn't sit out longer, right? Both because of the urgency of the political moment, but also because we needed to be able, like in the, in the, um, response to the ass assault on Gaza in 2014, a lot of our chapters wanted to engage in um, yes campaigns and activities in their local communities that were currently kind of beyond the path for what we were permitting our chapters to take part in. And it was disrupting relationships that we had at local groups and it just became unsustainable. Um, and it's actually really interesting because one of the things we learned on the other side of it and like all the fear that we had about what it would mean and for our reputation and our work is that we got so much stronger. Uh, we got so much bigger. We had a huge, huge growth spurt um, as an organism. Um, we basically doubled in size between 2014 and 2016. Um, and it was, the ideas were very resonant, right? And, you know, I think the attacks on BDS, um, that have come out of Israel right, um, are outsized in part because they are egalitarian, right? Like that anybody can engage in BDS campaigns. They around the globe can look, um, can figure out a way to participate, right? That's part of the beauty of the grassroots set of tactics. Um, and it's Palestinian civil society. Um, it's, you know, grassroots, right? For a long time, people, I often heard people, um, you know, defenders and enablers of Israel say like, well, where's the Palestinian Gandhi? Where's the Palestinian nonviolent movement, right? And then here comes the BDS movement. Um, and yet now that is not sufficient, right? It's like, the thing that is that the goalposts are always going to move. They're always going to change, right? And a lot of what people claim about the BDS movement is just not 
what it is, right? And I think there's a lot of fear that gets created around it precisely because it gets out of the hands of people that are really used to be able to control how things play out, right? Um, and so, you know, over the years at this point, you know, we s- remain the only Jewish um, organization in the US um, in our sphere to endorse the full BDS call, right? And of course it has had repercussions for us, right? As you said, like I wasn't allowed to board my plane at Dulles because of my support for BDS. Um, I'm myself, but also our organization, there's a lot of red lines that exist within the community that we are left out of. Um, There are organizations that we would want to partner with that won't partner with us, right? There's, of course, there's, um, we have, there's repercussions for this political state, but supporting this call from Palestinian society really is a no brainer. And I think we see the outsized response um, to yes, um, activities in the ways that anti BDS legislation um, is passed in outrageous ways, right? The ways in which, for example, in Texas, um, for people to get hurricane relief, they had to sign on the dotted line that they would not right. quote Israel, right? And I, um, I don't remember what's, I think it was Georgia, don't quote me on that. Um, another state, somebody on the call we will know and correct me in the chat box, but, you know, school teachers had to sign on the dotted line that they won't suppress to um, be able to be a, uh, I think it was a speech um, coach, speech counselor, right? These outrageous- A math teacher in Kansas, a math teacher in Kansas. Yeah, there's like, it's outrageous, outrageous, right? (laughs) Like, it's kind of like crazy to think about. It's like, why are going to these great lengths? And it is because there is no debate to be had about the actual, you know, defense of perpetual occupation the defense of denying refugees return to their homes and lands, defense of denying Palestinian citizens of Israel equal rights, a defense of not allowing there to be a true democracy of everyone who Israel controls having a vote, right? There's no defense for those policies. So instead you come under these attacks. And so um, the, somebody asked about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which is something JVP is, um, redoubling our efforts around because I, as we've seen I, I think what we're seeing now is that for years it has been like all the money and all the resources are going to combating BDS activity um, and now I think they're pivoting a little bit um, it's just a slight pivot right it's still um, to forwarding the way that they have passed these anti-BDS stations in these different I um, apologize of my lack of uh, memory for the details of the circumstances, but the way that the anti-BDS legislation has been kind of, there are these copycats across the, across the country that are passing in state legislatures. They're now doing the same with really dangerous definition of um, the IHRA definition. And, you know, it has the word hot in there, which was likely by design by those who were forwarding this as a definition. Um, it was really an important, thing to understand about that definition of anti-Semitism are a few things. One is the actual drafter of that definition, um, Ken Learn, opposes its uses, usage in um, litigation, legislation, um, college campuses, like the way that the Trump executive order from December and the Department of Education is using this definition um, the person who drafted it disagrees with it being used that way and says it was never designed to be used that way, but instead it was just to be for data collection purposes in Europe. And we can debate whether that it's even sufficient for that purpose, but despite that, that's its use. Um, the definition itself is extremely vague, right? And so it's kind of like, if everything is anti-Semitism, then nothing is. And it's insufficient as a definition. It include the definition, it's actually a very short, very vague definition. And then there's 11 examples and the seven of the examples that they use of what anti-Semitism can look like are about critique of Israel. Um, and so now we're seeing a strategy where they're trying to get that definition of anti-Semitism um, 
passed in a variety of venues. You might have seen that there was a big push to get book to adopt that definition, right? And what that would mean is that anybody critiquing Israel on Facebook labeled a hate crime and their posts would be removed. What the official response from Facebook was that they would use vague definition, but not the examples. Um, and which adds to nothing because the definition itself is so vague, um, but they did say they would divorce the examples from that. But at the same time, we're seeing it, um, it's been passed in Florida um, uh, under Governor Santos. Um, just yesterday, actually, JVP um, is in a, a international working group to combat this definition with people around the globe. Um, and we were hearing examples of the way that this is moving around the world. And uh, our friends at Independent Jewish Voices in Canada have actually been successful in pushing back the IHR mission getting passed in their provinces and legislatures um, through, all throughout Europe um, in parliaments um, and governments throughout Europe. Um, it's being passed. We're seeing it um, being pushed at the university level. Um, it's being snuck into kind of like as an addendum and other bills that we're seeing in Congress. Um, and so it's something that I think we really have to turn our attention to because I think um, part of the risk right now is because of the rise of actual anti-Semitism in the U.S., they, it's going to be easy for them to say that, oh, we're passing this IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And if you don't look into it, anybody who sees that or reads that will be like, that's a very welcome thing. Like, we need to combat anti-Semitism in this time, right? I think there's a big uphill battle for those of us that understand the intricacies of the definition and the dangers of it, like it's a big uphill PR battle for us basically, because it's a much harder to get attention. Like think about the scrolling that people do on social media to get their attention long enough to be like, don't be excited about the definition. Here's why it's bad. It does this, it does that, right? Like it's like, we have to explain a lot more as being able to say, you know, our university is combating anti-Semitism, right? And um, there's, you know, at NYU, um, like in the wake of the big order, there were a bunch of cases brought. NYU is one that sounds like, I don't, again, um, this is the details of the settlement, but there was a case brought against NYU that they violated um, the, you know, basically the anti-Semitic boundaries set at the Department of Education um, along the lines of the executive order. And through that settlement, the adoption of the HRA definition is part of that, right? So there's actually really dangerous um, precedent that we'll do, we'll just take activism on college campuses to a screeching halt. Um, and um, activism anywhere, right? Like if it's passed within our low municipalities or state legislatures. So it's something that we really have to, um, you know, be around. And I think that they are capitalizing on, grotesquely, they're capitalizing the, murders of Jews in the sense of solidarity that non-Jews will feel in wanting to start um, kind of legislating around anti-Semitism um, to shut down and completely silence um, any and all organizing and activism for pound rights. And we have to be vigilant to not let that happen. I'm aware that you uh, have only a three o'clock. And so, um, um, I, I want to squeeze in a couple questions real quick here um, so that uh, we get the benefit uh, of your answers. And I know we only have about 10 more minutes to go before your other talk to us. Uh, of course, the present administration is a disaster for human rights in general, much less Palestinian rights, much more Palestinian rights. Yet we see, uh, we see hopeful signs in Congress right, and in people running for Congress in a way that years ago I would not have predicted, I would not have been able to predict. But we also know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have not been friends of the Palestinians or of human rights in general uh, for Palestinians. Talk to us about activism, Palestinian activism during a, 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 hope, a hoped for Biden presidency. Yeah, so um, well, I'll first say uh, that, you know, I'm, it's exciting to be able to respond to this in part because JVP, um, uh, last year, actually right around this time, um, welcomed a sister organization into our family organizations, which is the Action, 
which lets us take part in the electoral process. Um, so where before we were more hamstrung and be able to like participate in elections. Right? And so, you know, part of the thing that I think is really sobering when we think about um, what the Biden administration will mean um, for our issue and our work, a lot of people that I've talked started to in different circles about, you know, what they're thinking about what a Biden administration will mean is a lot of people, especially those that are still clinging to this fantasy of a two state solution, is that um, they're going to want to kind of go back to uh, era politics around Israel. And the problem with that is that things have changed so tremendously on the ground. Trump and his enablers have wrought such um, havoc, right? With like, just on a practical level, what Netanyahu and Trump have done together um, from settlement expansion, de facto annexation, um, the moving of the Israel embassy, the cutting of financial aid for um, Palestinians, these kind of quote unquote normalizing of ties, um, these different Arab nations, right? You can't go back. You can't go back to Obama era diplomacy with Israel. There's the conditions have changed and actually by right. design, right? There's actually this, this idea in conflict negotiation theory, which is called BATNA, which stands for best alternative to negotiated agreement. Right? And that's kind of been Israel's strategy, right? Is to build their BATNA, right? And so that when you get to the negotiating table, the conditions have so drastically changed in your favor. Um, and so I think that's one thing just is that um, they may want to go back to that Obama era, but that there's nothing, that's not gonna be possible. The next thing is that unfortunately it does things like the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which we were just talking about, is gonna be supported and forwarded by the Biden administration. They are gonna likewise, just like the Trump administration is due, they're gonna support efforts to legislate um, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, the Obama era policies that people are longing for, right, are not, are not um, generous or compassionate or, equitable um, towards Palestinians, right? And towards organizing for Palestinian rights in the US. Um, and so I think while it's clear he's, it's gonna be really, really hard to go backwards, right? From where Trump has brought things, right? Uh, and so I do feel though that in, in, a, in a time where if it is a Biden administration, part of the thing that's going to be happening, at least in the early months, that there's going to be a lot of cleanup to do on domestic issues, right? We're going to have to fix our immigration system. We're going to have to fix our health care system, right? We're going to, there's a lot that we're going to have to address the, um, you know, the coronavirus actually and for real, right? There's like got to be a lot of urgent work. And I think those um, efforts to undermine the movement for Palestinian rights and um, the calls for Palestinian rights are just gonna actually be more challenging. So I think we're our work cut out for us of getting people's attention, right? Of how do we ensure that people, even as we are trying to fix things in this country and um, ensure that people are living lives of dignity um, in this country. And so many are deeply committed to that for Palestinians as well. And we have to see how deeply interconnected those things are, right? I think as the, like, we were talking about the anti-BDS legislation that is curtailing what's possible in our education systems, right? That it is so deeply connected. And I think it's gonna be incumbent upon us to, um, as with the deadly exchange campaign, as with our support for the movement for lives, as in our, our kind of connections that we make between, um, you know, these technologies of surveillance and control that are shared between the US and Israel is that we continue to have to be part of these intersectional movements for justice and continue to draw the connections. And because there is not, you know, in my view, there's nothing that's just a domestic issue anymore. Everything crosses um, these state lines, these um, borders of our countries, right? And so, um, it's going to be incumbent upon us to ensure that um, 
we attend to the damage that has been done over these four, four years. We hold back, you know, these efforts to undermine um, our movement and our organizing um, and, and see what ground we can gain through the Senate. So the last thing I wanna say is that there's, you know, the, what you were saying about like our champions in Congress, I think supporting them with everything that we have is so critical, right? And ensuring that we flip as many seats in the Senate as we possibly can, because um, that's what's really gonna, right? If Congress is gonna our most for our goals. Um, and so for us at JVP Action, um, between now and and the election, we're really focusing on two races in particular. We're joining forces with a group in the South called Song Power, to, and they have a campaign to take out Senator Lindsey Graham, who's a powerful crony, as a lot of us know. He's a white Christian Zionist, and he spent 17 years attacking queer and trans people, women, and working people while also entrenching Israeli apartheid over Palestinians. So we're working on his, on his race in South Carolina, on that race to get him unseated. And also in Texas, um, one of our um, insurgent candidates that we endorsed is this Jewish progressive named Mike Siegel. And he is challenging um, the reprehensible representative Michael McCall in Texas. Yeah. Um, and so while McCall, who is the leading Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, you know, made a name for himself by leading the attacks of weaponized anti-Semitism against Rep. Ilhan Omar. So we're, we're throwing our weight behind Siegel. So we're really hoping in those two races to kind of flip some seats um, and get these um, two out of office in South Carolina and Texas. So if anybody here wants to participate in that, um, you can reach out to us at JVP Action. We're hosting a bunch of phone banks. Um, we're doing some fundraising, um, text banking, and um, doing what we can from wherever we are to to flip those seats because we really understand flipping seats blue in the South for this election really matters. Congress matters most for our goals. And um, it's also a chance to fight back against some of these Christian Zionists that are determining US policy on Israel-Palestine, so. Well, Alyssa, uh, th this is unfair, but it's an important question. Can you give us the, the uh, 30 second to 60 second answer and tell us where to go to find out more? And that is, What's JVP's position on the one Democratic state campaign or any, any of the one Democratic state possibilities out there? Do you support such a thing? Yeah, thank you. Um, my dog is now wanting to get part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, that's enough of this talking. Um, so, you know, JVP has not does not have an official position on one state. Um, for a long time, our position has been that, you know, our role as American Jews and allies um, is to support Israelis and Palestinians to get to the negotiation table as equal partners. And so part of our role has been to put our finger on the scale for Palestinians, right? And build Palestinian political power so that Palestinians and Israelis who are the ones who should figure out their own future are the ones to determine it for themselves. Um, so that has long been our position. I will say that, you know, in over the, these past four years, which have been so intense and the changing political dynamics, it is something we're talking about more, but at this point, we don't have a revised position on that. Alyssa, thanks for coming today. Do you have any parting words for us before you head off to your next meeting? Oh yeah. I just really wanna thank you all for having me. And I think, you know, these are really trying political times. And so I just really hope that everybody is taking good care of themselves in it, right? And um, finding ways to decompress and enjoy yourself. And right now is the middle of the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, where it's um, the commandment for Sukkot is to be joyous and feel joy. It's also called Zman Simchatenu, which means the time of our joy. Um, and so I've just been relishing in that, in that, um, commandment and that invitation from, from Jewish wisdom. I just want to extend it to all of you that you find little ways to find joy in your life because the work is hard, but in order to stay with it, we have to enjoy ourselves sometimes. So that's my wish for you. Take care. Thanks for having me.